Never had a lot of shit come easy. Had to work hard, struggle just to be me. Had to be And what was left over I put towards my dreaming. But the only thing in life that has meaning are the things you gotta work for, believe me. Take into your hands a plan, your own hands can land your own brand and damn I feel like no one takes accountability, they want the credibility Convincingly unwilling to put in the f hours It takes to get some power, don't be f***ing sour Take a cold shower, scream until you're louder Work until you're prouder and f*** all the doubters They're just young downers I swear to God they all let me down I always watch I can tell you that seven years after Freddie Gray that was 2015, spring, April, May. This is 2022. Communities like Sandtown, all we saw then and now in terms of investment was a renovated Western District Police Station and a new funeral home. That's what West Baltimore got. A new police station and a new funeral home. What kind of optics are they? Was, was Freddie Gray any different than 1968 Baltimore riots? Dr. King's passing, killing, murder? Is it the same? Uh, no, it wasn't. I mean, I, I, I think, well, first of all, uh, people who are, are doing uh, violent and burning, uh, is, is, that's, you know, it, all of that's the same. Uh, but the point is, is what was the cause? And what were they attempting to register? I always fought just to wear the crown. I'm off at these fucking clowns. I love you. They deserve it now. It's a good name. And I'll be fucked. It's only worth it if you work for it. I won't stop till they hear me now. I won't stop till I wear the crown. I swear to God, they don't let me down. Good morning, it's a beautiful day in the neighborhood. First name's Donnie, last name's Glover. In it, the winner for the long haul baby. Now, family, we get to do a lot of interviews. We interview a lot of politicians, business leaders. But this time, we're going to go into the arts. And we have with us a gentleman with 36 movies 36 to his credit is that what i count it you count it correct phenomenal dan and green yay what's going on brother i'm grateful man big ups to cynthia please let's give love to our sister from chicago yes miss cynthia boinkins thank you so much man because i don't want no trouble is that your line that used to be my line i still kind of say it every now and then but that was my Catch line when I was doing, a, you know, when I first started doing comedy, probably for about five, almost 10 years, just, you know. So let me get this right. You were born in Manhattan and raised in Philly. Yes. Born in how Manhattan, did, New York. How did that, how, what happened? Uh, I, actually, man, I am a uh, foster child. I'm a, I was a ward of the state of New York. Um, and uh, I, uh, so I was awarded the state of New York and I got adopted at seven and my mom moved me to Philadelphia and I lived in Philly until I was 15. Unfortunately, I lost her when I was 15. And then I lived for two years with my adopted brother and then pretty much been on my own since 17 years of age. Well, you ain't in your 20s. Nah, so I, I, it was a while ago, but I, I did all right. Yes, you did. You know, Cynthia told me about some time she spent in New York. Mm -hmm. We had on the show, she was talking about this girl's, this girl's home she had to, that she stayed at. Okay. Yes, yeah, she did tell me about that. Yes. And I mean, traumatic things, man. People don't, you know, sometimes we don't think about the difficult situations that others have come through. Yes, yes, yes. And your spirit is strong, man. Yeah, but well, you know, I never, uh, Donnie, man, I never, I always felt, I, I was always mature 
past my years, always, bro. And I used to always say, at the end of the day, people don't care about what you've been through, especially if you go the the other way. They may, you know, oh, sad, you know, sad or whatever. But at the end of the day, they they don't really care. And I used to, I, I'm a big history buff, and I, I'm a, when I was younger, I was a big big and I still am a news watcher. I'm very observant about what goes on in the world. And I used to, you know, back in the day I would be in Philly and I'd be watching channel six or channel 10 or channel uh, two, you know, and they would be, you know, you would always see the trial, you know, there'd be like a criminal trial going on at some time. You know how they do it. They show something that might've happened. And you, and I always used to say that you would see the lawyer go explain that his client you know, grew up in a broken home, was was abused and all that type of stuff. And the judge would go, yeah, I understand that. Now, now he still got to do, the, he got to give me these 25 years, but I'm sorry that this happened to him. You know what I mean? So I always said at the end, nobody really, you know, you at the end, really nobody really cares about your your past if you, if you go the negative route. They feel bad for you, but so I had to make a decision on which, which way I'm going to take my life. And so when I was 17, when I was on my own at 17 years of age, um, I just oh, oh, oh. said I got to do it. How you on your own at 17? What happened to 18? Well, at at uh, what happened was my my brother, God rest his soul, um, he was taking care of me from 15 to 17, and Mike was from Philly, and uh, you know, but we was living in Maryland, and um, Mike was a hustler. You know what I'm saying? Mike very smart, but he was a hustler and stuff like that. Well, anyway, I came home one day. From school, I was going to uh, Eleanor Roosevelt, and I was actually going to Eleanor Roosevelt in Greenbelt, Maryland. And um, down, down in PG County. Yeah, PG County. Yeah, and um, I came home one day, and there was a U-Haul truck parked outside, and I thought we was moving again, you know, because I moved from Philly to New Hampshire to Maryland after my mom died with him. And uh, I said, "Where are we moving to?" And he was like, "You know, we ain't moving anywhere. I'm, I'm moving back to Philly." And I was like, what about me? Like, you staying here? Because I was in my last year of high school. So my last year of high school, from February on, I, I was by myself. Where you get money from? Uh, I wound up, I was a track dude. I've always been an athlete. I was a track dude. Um, he said he was going to pay the rent up for a few months. That didn't really happen. But I was living there for about two or three, you know, two or three months. And um, I wound up quitting track. And I got a job as a dishwasher at a restaurant. And that was I, last I never year told, high school. Yeah, I never told a teacher. I never told anybody. I just stayed on. I just I, it's a crazy story, bro. But I never told anyone. And I um, only a couple of my partners at school knew. And um, I got up every morning, went to school, and I, 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 status quo, seventeen. Yeah. Sometimes I can't believe it. Sometimes I can't believe I did it, but I did it. Did you graduate? I graduated. Um, you graduated? Yeah, I let me put it this way: I graduated. Uh, I applied to colleges on my own. Um, I got accepted to a school in Iowa, and because I, I made a promise, I said the first school that accepts me, that's where I'm going. Because I didn't have anywhere else to go, and I wasn't going to go into the military. Because that's what my other family members like trying to say. Well, maybe you should go into the military. I'm like, you know, I was. It made me mad, but I because I was like, I felt like they was trying to push me off. And then, um, so what happened was, uh, I got excited. Why you didn't want to go in the military though? Because I don't, I have no, I'm not getting up in the morning to do, do no running and all that. And, and I couldn't, and, and even though I can fight, I didn't, I, I, I would say I can't kill nobody in cold blood. You know what I mean? And I knew that if I got in the military, that would be something I have to do. Now, I can kill you if you do something to me, but I just can't kill you off of GP. You know what I mean? I didn't go in the military for similar reasons. I didn't want, some bad breath sergeant in my face telling me to go take that hill while he pointing. Right. <laughs> and I'm gonna yeah. ask, well, where are you gonna be? Where we where yeah. we gonna be? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I I rejected that notion too. They were trying to my dad brought me an application to the Naval Academy. Mm -hmm. And it just didn't fit into yeah. my I took spirit. the military, I took the military test while I was in high school one time. And I graded high in history. They said I would probably be a historian. So I could have probably been that kind of person where, a, you know, a leader or a general or something like that. But um, like that's again, not man, where I was you like, wanted to make 
lemonade out of lemons. Right. So, so my last year in high school, I graduated. I applied to colleges on my own. I was living on my own. Um, I uh, my brother had left some a checkbook. I took stolen checks and I, I applied to five schools. Two story, you know, because you had to pay for your application to be processed. Remember that back in the day. Five dollars. Yeah, twenty five. Yep. And then um, I wind up uh, getting accepted to a school in Davenport, Iowa, and um, in I went Iowa. To- it yeah. don't get no non blacker than that. Hey, I told people it was only two blacks in the, the state when I got there. That's my joke. Me and the brother who thought he was in Chicago. You know what I mean? So, <laughs> <laughs> and uh, so applied to school and um, man, you know, wind up uh, getting accepted. Went to school four years, did well. I applied to graduate school, got accepted to grad school. I went to the Ohio State University. I got my master's degree. Uh, uh, you you can't do that. I, I, come on, say it one more time. I got my master's degree from Ohio State University. No, the no, no. Ohio State University. Wow, you look like one of them football players now. Yeah, 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 yeah. And um, you know what, bro? Yeah. I never look back. You know what I'm saying? I I just I never look back. You know, it was a it was tough. It was a tough time. I had a very tough time after my mom passed. You know, my whole life has been tough emotionally, and you know because you. You know, you got, I had to navigate through it, but at the end of the day, I just, I just never believed in pointing fingers at people. Did you connect with your family? I haven't yet. My, my, my. Oh, you mean my adopted family? Blood. No, I've never, I've never met anyone in my uh, blood family. Never have. So, and I, they say I have a brother who's eighteen months older than me, but you know, my, my paternal mother died when I was less than two. Like so, that's why I was awarded the state because she was sick off and on. So I'm, they made me award award of New York. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I got a story, brother. When you went back to New York, how did that feel? As, you as know, a, it was. Grown, I'm gonna tell you the craziest thing, man. man. Uh, last year, it was real emotional when I went back to New York to screen this movie because I made it into the Manhattan Film Festival. And so for me to, I said, I told the audience, for me to, um, you know, to be awarded the state, to be a foster kid of the state, and to be able to come back and screen the movie, it was just, you know, it was just surreal. You know what I mean? It was crazy. Mm-hmm. Have you written any books? No books yet. I've been... That's probably going to be my next project. Um, I got the documentary done. I have a, you know, which we'll talk about. And I'm a screenwriter. So I've written five screenplays. I currently have a movie that I wrote that is, I just got optioned and got a producer and a director attached. So my goal right now is to get that movie done. But after this event here, um, I made a promise that I'm going to start sitting down and write my life story. Yeah, because I think it's a it's a story that people really need to know about. And I couldn't write it for a long time. I tried to, but it got too emotional. You know what I mean? I, I would start writing. And I'd just be crying and stuff like I can't. You know, I couldn't deal with it. You know what I mean? But now I can. I, you know, I'm past that and I still get emotional, but I can I can get past that and write it. You know, you know, I never hit. I never um, I never shied away from my story. But when you go through stuff like I went through, you uh. You um, um, you know what's the word I want to say? You, you, you don't hide it, but you, 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 you kind of keep it suppressed because, again, I don't believe in having people. I don't believe in blaming people for my for my what what, what kind of life I've had. You know what I mean? Well, let me just tell you, Dan. I've met a lot of people. A lot of people use that. And it hurts them, and and they use it as a yes, want, to want sympathy, to want empathy. I mean, it's almost like the pretty girl with the car broke down stereotype, right? Oh, will you help me? Will you help me? You know, I'm the victim. Yeah, I, when I, I wrote, when I wrote my ooh. autobiography, I got a chance to go back and remember things that I had forgotten. Wow. And they weren't all bad memories. It's a lot right. of 
a lot of good that the fact that we're still here means right. was more good than bad. Right. And you're yeah. in your right mind. And you yep. know people like Cynthia, and you just produce your your is this your first film? My first feature film. I did a first short feature film before. Film. I did a 15 minute film, a 20 minute film before, but this is my first feature film. Okay, well, well, tell us about your film and congratulations. So, thank you, just so surviving, thriving, not being a victim, being a victor. I ain't even you mentioned any church. I, I guess the church is in you, huh? Yeah, yeah. Well, no, I, 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 I like to joke and tell people I got saved twice. Now, I, I don't do everything right, but I've been, you know, I've been involved with the church most of my life. But I said I got saved at eighteen. I met a girl in college. You know how it is. You're chasing the girls. You come to church with me. Oh, go to church, and I wound up joining the church. I, I, I got saved the first time. I like to say baptized the first time under the Pentecostal religion, and then. You know, I did that for the first year and a half in college. Then, you know, I went back wild and out. And then when I moved to California, I met another girl. And uh, she was going to church, got with her. And so I, I, I'm i a member of Faithful Central uh, Baptist Bible Church, which is a big church in L.A. And uh, I don't go that much no more. But, you know, I'm a very, I don't, I don't like to say spiritual. I'm a very, I try to really, I'm a very God-fearing dude. Even though I know I don't do everything right, I still, you know, I know. You know what I mean? You have a conscience. I got, I got, well, that's the only reason I became, a, I didn't, I'm going to be honest with you, Donnie, that's the only reason I didn't become a drug dealer, because my brother was a drug dealer, but my conscience, again, I knew the game of life, and I knew if you get into that game, one, you're always going to have to watch your back, but two, you're going to have to take somebody out at one time, and I didn't want that. You're going to, because somebody's going to try to take you, somebody's going to try to burn you, and you're going to have to get them. It's just no ifs or buts about it. You can't, you know, whether you Take them out completely, or you shoot them. I didn't want that on my conscience. My yeah. father was a funeral director, Danny. Oh, your father I, was? I grew up above a funeral home until I was about nine. Oh, oh, funeral director. Yeah, we lived above. He had a he and my mom owned the funeral home downstairs. Okay. And every time I saw a body on the slab, young, old, black, white, male, female. One lesson always stuck with me. Dead is dead. It ain't no, right. I'm sorry. I didn't mean it. Dead right. is dead. Right. It's dead is dead, and brother. And that's why, thank God, I have not killed anybody. Right. You know, and um, because that's the mean I thing on like the street. Uh, It'll wake yeah. you up in the middle of the night. Wow. Yeah, I just felt, um, I just felt. You know that was my reason. That was my reason for not getting into it. But I, but I went to, I went to Ohio State. I got into the entertainment. I first started doing stand up out there, moved to L.A. That, that then, Ohio State. That was grad school. Yes, graduate school, nineteen eighty eight to nineteen ninety. But I lived in Columbus from eighty eight to ninety two. So how is Ohio compared to your East Coast experiences? You I like. Remember? I really liked Ohio. I think if I wasn't in entertainment. I would have stayed in Columbus because I got to know Columbus. But as I got into entertainment, I be I, I started I felt like I was becoming too big for the city. Like the city wasn't big enough for me. You know what I mean? Like it was just so I, I left. But I had a good I had a good report. You were right. I like I like I liked Ohio actually. But you were right. Yeah, yeah. For and your career for expansion and growth, you needed a bigger flower pot. Yeah, especially back then because we didn't have social media. You know what I mean? We didn't have social media. We didn't have cell phones. So it's not like I could do there during the day. You know what I mean? People don't understand. You know, you don't now. You don't. If you don't want to come to Cali, you can be on home. You know, in the middle of you know a shack and make videos all day, and all of a sudden people think you're a star. But anyway, that's why I moved to Cali. But I got. How was, how was Cali? I, Cali's cool. You know, I, I I have a saying, and I think. When you have had the life I've had, I went to four high schools in three different states. I've always I moved a lot. I have a saying where I hate when people, well, not I don't hate when people, because everybody has the right to say what they say, but I, when people say, oh, man, I need to move. I always say, this is how's Cali or how's this? You know, gas is high. It's crazy. But it is. I will say this to people. You got to live somewhere. <laughs> so either way, you know what I mean? You got to, unless you don't plan on living here in the States. So, so something's gonna be wrong somewhere. So, 
you know, I I, uh, I uh, definitely have no problem with California. California's been good to me. The people have been cool with me. You know, and you know, when you, I, I would say when you're a true East Coast person, a true East Coast person, you, this you know how to maneuver. Is. Yeah. You know how to maneuver around. You know what I'm saying? East Coast. So is that almost an advantage that you have, uh, uh, an East Coast person has on the West Coast? When I feel for me, because trust and believe me, when you hear about a lot of people being fake and phony and all that in California, a lot of those people come from other parts of the country and they're the ones that are the fake because they get caught up. Because LA people actually, man, LA people are down, they, you know, they are down to earth. And when you go down to South Central and all of them boys, they they about that life down there. You know, what you hear is what's really going on. And so LA people are grounded, but in LA people respect the game. But a lot of people that become phony are people that don't even, not even from LA. They move to LA, they move to Hollywood and get caught up in everything. And that was one of the reasons that I moved to California because when I was doing stand, started stand up in, in, in Ohio, there was a comedian, Rich Scheidner, this white comic, who was, uh, you might remember, he, he played in the movie Roxanne years ago with Steve Martin and all that. I met him at a comedy club and I was talking to him throughout the whole week. He was in Columbus. And this is a true story, Donnie. He said to me, he said, he said, man, how old are you? Right? White man says, I said, I'm 26. So we were talking all week about, you know, comedy and, you know, because I'm trying to like figure it out. And he goes, how old are you? And I go, I'm 26. He goes, you need to move to LA. And I said, why do you say that? And he said, you seem mature enough not to go get caught up in the lights. He said, go, you, should, you should move to LA. And that was the reason that I moved to LA. Because he was like, you know, you and then and, and I, my late brother was living the one that we had separated. We wound up connecting. He was living in Long Beach, so it was an easy move for me. You know what I mean? It just happened to work out like that. You reconnected. Yeah. How did that go? It was crazy. We talked, and he was like, you know, his, his exact line was, "Man, you did everything you were supposed to do, man." So you know. You know, we got to try to help you out. So, you know, and I was job hunting. He said, so if you want, you can come out and live with me. So I moved out to L.A. with him in March of 1992. And then by, by August 2nd of 92, we had it. We had we been having another fallout and I was homeless for two months again. <laughs> so, uh, you know, I, I didn't learn my lesson the first time, but, you know, I got it now. <laughs> Maya Angelo, when they show you who they are. They are who they are. Me. Yeah. But I, you know, I came out to LA, got into the game. Uh, I didn't get into the, I didn't, I built my rep as a, a stand-up comic. A lot of people know me from Comic View and all those TV shows. And then, um, I, you know, I've been, I started writing in '99, and um, I was in a workshop. I was in this big boot camp workshop with Bill Duke, uh, the director, and he was in there with Taraji Henson. Anthony Anderson, Chris Spencer, Shamal Moore, Lisa Ray, we all were in the same big acting workshop class. And Bill Duke encouraged us to write. And that's when I started writing screenplays. And what, what, they, why? Why did he encourage you to write? Is, is, who is Bill Duke? I, I don't know. Okay, Bill Duke is one of our top, one of our greatest black actors, black directors, and black socialist person that, you know, uh community you know person that really wants to help the community you know what i mean he's very pro-black from new york a socialist no i don't want to say i said the wrong word he's not a socialist um what i want to say uh that's not because he's activist. not a socialist activist thank you thank you thank you okay. activist i apologize as, as you mentioned socialists who came to mind was paul robeson yeah 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 no he's not a socialist yeah because paul robeson went over to russia yeah i know his story too yeah but no he um he uh he was a, a, a act, he's a big activist, but he's very pro-black and he's very pro trying to help black entertainers and people to get together. So the first time we were in his class, we were always in it. Like I said, I'm talking about heavy hitters was in there. I mean, from um, I mean, like I said, everybody was in there. And it was about 25 of us. And he asked each and every one of us, hey, what do you do? What do you do? What do you do? And we were all saying different things. I'm a comedian, I'm a writer, I'm a director. You know, we know we're young and everybody's, you know saying what they do. And he said, see, the difference between you and me is that I'm an entrepreneur. I'm all of those things. He said, 
for you to make it out here, you have to own intellectual properties. And so he said, and he encouraged us to write. He said, because you don't want to be 55 still auditioning for work. And that's and it hit me like a ton of Brooks, bricks. And that's when I started writing. So I've written uh, five films. You, you, um, you I, ain't, I, ain't, I ain't gonna let you out of that. I ain't gonna let you out of that. I, I need okay. you. We got some people who may be right there. Right. You you are laying the framework for success in life. Yes. You, you go out there and we think it's about getting some auditions. But you said Bill Duke encouraged you to write, and I'm a writer. Right. Journalism, news. But even, even in journalism, there are not a lot of black writers. No. And that, that's why my job never ends because I'm trying to counter. I don't know if you know the film. D.W. Griffith, The Birth of a Nation, the first feature film in America about 1917. No, no, but I heard about it. It put out the worst stereotypes. A black kid, so yes, I remember that. Yes. They showed it at the White House. They showed people from other countries, this is how we treat them. And so when you get a Paul Robeson, when you get a Sidney Poitier, when you get a, I'm sure you've heard of Oscar Michaud. Oscar Michaud had he had, he was like the first black film producer. He had 44 films, Oscar okay. show. When you have these people breaking down barriers, it opens the door decades later for a Spike Lee, for Regina King. Yes. Uh, for our, for, for our, our generation. Yeah. And then you have to open doors for people coming 30 years behind you. Yeah. You know, it's a, uh... You know, uh, it was something that I, I, I just knew, you know, and, and you gotta remember, Donnie, my background always told me, see, I, I would say the disadvantage of my background that, oh, but also worked to my advantage was I'm always in survival mode. Cause when you, when you are raised by yourself, you know what I mean? You, you know, that decisions that you make when you make them, you don't have someone saying you shouldn't do that. See, and I haven't had nobody really tell me what I shouldn't do since the age of 17. You know what I mean? I've had people suggest, but I could do whatever I wanted to do. And so when you have that freedom, it also can be tough on you because you don't know if you're making the right decisions or not. But you got to you got to make that decision. You got to stick to it and do that game plan. I ain't no holy roller. But in 20 years of doing this news operation, Be More News, Black USA, in 20 years, it was less than four or five times that I said, the hell with this, I'm going to go get a job. Right. In 20 years, maybe four times, and when the thought came, I swear to you, Danny, I would get a knock at the door. Right. Or I get a phone call, and they said these words. The money will come. Right. Right. That's what yeah. I that's don't worry about it. I sent you. It's like God give you the vision, he'll give you the provision. Right. Well, you know, you gotta you ha I there was times that I was in this game where um you know I had some bad shows or things like that, and I felt like maybe I shouldn't do this, but you know, when I was in track. I had a partial scholarship I could have gotten in track, but I never pushed it because of me having to quit. You know, when I was fighting, I was a you know two-time Golden Gloves champ. I could have went pro, but I didn't oh, go oh, pro. Oh, 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 oh. You done left all of that out. Well, that's part of the documentary story. So we can, you know, me, that's why I did this documentary. So what's the name of the documentary? The documentary is called The Executioners. We all had a chance. And it's a story about a film, about a gym I used to belong to out of Philadelphia that I joined in 1979, 1980 as a kid in Philadelphia. And I joined it and I boxed it for two years. Were you like 14? Huh? You were 14? I was 14 when I first started. And why you joined um, the gym? Huh? Why you joined the gym? Um, <laughs> because I had two buddies. The, you took a couple L's in the street. Actually, I never took an L in the street. I got sucker punched one time when I was 
12, 13 by an old head. One time I had an argument with the, on the basketball court, you know, argue about that it was my game next. And the dude sucked and punched me. But my cousin was there. My cousin Frank Brown was there. So my cousin fought the dude. But the dude didn't drop me. You know what I mean? I was shocked. I was like, oh, you know, but everybody saw it. But by that time, my cousin Frank came out and was like, yo, so that's what happened. But um, I, I never took an L in the street. I can say that. I had How three fights in the gym? Huh? How you end up in the gym? Because I have I had two friends. One of my friends actually just passed, God rest his soul. But two of my buddies that um I used to hang with in elementary school through junior high school, we used to always slap box. You know how we do that. And these dudes was they was always tagging me. And I was like, man, what? you know, how do you not, you know, like I'm just just, just, just did like how do you do? And I was taller than them. So anyway, I'm walking down Lansdowne Avenue in Philadelphia. And they're coming catty corner. So we meet at the corner one day. This is no lie after school. And they got bags. I was going to the store. And I like, and they lived on 61st Street and I lived on Felton Street. So they lived like four city, four blocks away. You know how the streets are in Philly. So I go, yo, what's up, y'all? Yo, what's up, Dan? I said, where y'all, where y'all going? He said, are we going to the gym? I said, what gym y'all going to? What kind of gym? He said, are we, are we going to the boxing gym? I said, y'all box? He said, oh yeah, we box. I was like, why y'all ain't never tell me? But you know, when you kids back then, you know, we had cell phones, you don't share stuff. You go to school with people and that's it. Your life at home is your life at home. You know, you know how your mom would say, what happens in the house stays in the house. So I guess they was like, you know, they, we just never talked about it. Man, I but ran home. explain how they were really good. They were fast. Well, yeah. So I, I tell you, I ran home. I said, and said to my mom, mom, I want a box. And I box. And she was like, nope. I said, please. I said, nope. She said, nope. I said, and then I lied. I said, I've been having troubles in the street. She said, I don't care. You can't box. So I was like, all right. So then she came back two days later and said, all right, you can box, but I hope you get hurt. I'm like, that didn't make sense. You know what I mean? <laughs> and that's how I got invo <laughs> involved in boxing. <laughs> yes. Encouraging words from your mother. You know what I mean? <laughs> Damn, that's the best joke. Man. So I wind up... Um, um, joining the gym, and then they wind up quitting. They quit, and I stayed the longest, and I got, the and I became spirit, the best out of all of them. Spirit, hey, Dan, and the spirit led you to that boxing gym for whatever yeah. reason. The spirit yeah. led you there. Yeah. And wow. so, so I started boxing. Came in second in the city in '81 in Junior Olympics. Um, I lost in the championship fight to go to the regionals. Um, and then my mom died. And then I had six, seven years. I didn't do anything. I was going to school, you know, trying to, I was moving a lot, but I was always, anywhere I moved, I would try to box, but I never fought. So what happened was in 1987, when I'm living in Iowa, I, I went to school in Davenport, Iowa. Um, I was boxing out of a gym. I started just going there to train and I was, you know, get, get in shape. So I was training and that was the same gym that Michael Nunn is from. Michael second to none. So I'm at the gym one day, and then one day we got all these camera people in there. There, and what happened was Michael Nunn was coming back to Iowa for a fight. He was three coming back three fights before he fought for the world championship, before he knocked out Frank Tate. So he was coming back for a fight, and he had did all his heavy sparring in California. So Jim is there. He's in town doing. I didn't even know it. So they the, the owner of the gym comes to me and goes, "They because well, Michael was southpaw. He was fighting a left hander." And I'm Southpaw. So they were like, hey, Green, you want to spar none? I was like, because it was a Latin, a Mexican player named Alvino Pena, real cool, crazy dude. So I go, like, like the gym is packed with news people and everything. I'm like, and people, I go, yeah. It's just like you would see at a Mayweather thing before a fight, like that type of stuff. So I go, yeah. So I sparred with Michael Nunn for three days. And I did really well. And people were shocked. They were like, Cause you know, like again, you know, I hadn't been involved in boxing because my mom died and I moved. But they was like, "Oh, this dude, you know, you can go." So I, so I said, "You know what? Maybe I should get back into it." Because I kept saying, "I'm not gonna fight nobody in the amateurs as good as this dude. I'm not gonna fight anybody this good as this guy." And I went three days with him. So I got my head refocused, and I joined the gym, and I ran off twelve straight, thirteen straight wins, and uh, two Golden Glove tournaments. I won them. What yeah, stopped and, you from going pro? <laughs> so funny story is, I'm getting my master's from Ohio State. 
I had just graduated. I get invited to Ray Leonard's gym in Palmer Park, Maryland. So I'm down at Ray's gym because they were looking for Ray, they were looking for some fighters, and my boy told them about me. So they're like, okay, we'll, we'll take a look at them. So I go, I drive from Ohio down to Palmer Park. And you remember, my aunt and uncle were living in Maryland. So that was my connection of having somewhere to stay after, you know, because I was on my own. So I go down to the to the uh, Palmer Park, Maryland, and I sparred two arrays sparring partners. And man, the first day they put they put me through it. They they was they was begging, you know, they're not gonna let nobody come in there off the street. You're not you sparring you, you sparring the top dudes. So for two for the first day they was they was on me, and I and I was nervous, and I had an amateur style, you know, just trying to just throw punches, you know what I mean? Like, and they and pro styles more laid back. They they like you know. We we won't be here all day, you know what I mean? Amateurs, you know, you think you only got three rounds. Pros are like, you know, our goal is when we don't get you in three rounds, we we'll get you in the tenth. Well, we're gonna get you. So my thing was, I was you know doing a lot of fast sparring, and this dude I was sparring, he was just setting, he was just really laid back, and he saw an opening. I mean, he cracked me with a right hand. I went back. I didn't fall because uh, I've always had a good chin. Always had a good chin. He was a hundred and 65 pound, his name was Bird. Both of them was 165. I was weighing 47, 52. So I, I, my uncle was joking. He said, I was taking pictures of you too. He got he hit you with that right hand. I was like, oh, yeah. So, so what happened was that night I went home, him and I strategized. Like, what did you do wrong? You know, we talked about it and all that. <clears throat> and I was rushing and all that. So the next day I came back, I slowed it down and I did way better. So my uncle went to Pepe Guerrero and another trainer and said, what do you think about him? They said, we like him. They said, we like him, but we can't do nothing with him right now because Ray Lennon's coming in for his last fight against Terry Norris. So what happened was I wound up going back to Ohio, and I started thinking. I'm saying to myself, you know what? I just spent six years in college. Education really ain't that bad to have. You know what I mean? So I said, nah, I ain't going to go pro. But I kind of regret not going pro a little bit because uh, I was told that I would have been a – they told me I would have been a way better pro than an uh, amateur because I, I already had came from that pro background. But there's another side to it. Two, yeah, you could get hurt. Yeah, yeah, and I and I and hey, I already talk with a slight list when I get excited. So I ain't need I ain't need to be I ain't need to have no bad speech, no more added to what I got going on already. So yeah, you know, Dan and I met a boxer once, and he was more than a boxer. He had no bodyguards. Probably had a pretty lady with him. His name was Muhammad Ali. He came yes. to the college right here in Baltimore in the middle of the city, Coppin State. But what I'll never, ever, 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 ever forget, that man stayed and talked to everyone. He shook yes. everybody's hands. Yeah. I, I actually, let me, let me tell you my great Muhammad Ali story. So, 19... I'm, I'm, I'm fighting in the Golden Gloves in Huntington, West Virginia. My first fight. This is the same year that Buster Douglas knocked out Mike Tyson. So Douglas was from Columbus. So at the Golden Gloves, Ali and Buster Douglas were there. And for $10, you could take two pictures. You could take a picture with both of them. You know what I mean? So I'm in line. I pay my $10. I'm in line to uh, take pictures. And um, um as I get about five or six people before I go ready to take my picture, my trainer, Von Zell Johnson, comes to me. He goes, Hey Green, you gotta go get lace, you gotta go get ready, man. You fight in two fights. So you, I want you to go back to the, the locker room and get dressed up and all that so I can wrap you. I said, Okay. So I go back to the to the locker room and uh I get dressed up, put up, you know, get laced up, and I'm walking to the ring, right? I'm walking to the ring. What about and, your picture? Huh? What about your picture? I'm gonna tell you this story. So so I'm walking to the ring, and when I look up, Douglas already had left, and Muhammad Ali was leaving. So I stopped right there. I go, hey, hold up. He said, what's wrong? To my trainer, we're ready to get in the ring. I said, I paid $10 to take a picture with him. And he said, you got to fight. And I was like, I don't care. I paid $10 to get a picture with him. So my trainer yells over to um, my man, yells over to Ali's people and goes, hey, the kid said he paid. Ten paid to take a picture with Ali. So his, his handlers look at him and go, oh, yeah, he, that, he paid. And Ali walked over to me. And uh, 
took a picture with me. And I got, I, I don't know if you, I, I'm trying to find the picture on right now on my phone. But, but that's, the kind of, that's the kind of person he was. Yes. And so yes. when I meet people, whether they're boxing or politics, and they don't have that kind of humility, then they're not great. Right. I just yeah. see people at the White House. They're supposed to be famous. But they don't even want to open their mouth. Yeah. Ali was so let me hey, so let me tell you the other part of that story. So I take the picture with Ali. So <clears throat> after my fight, I'm going back to the hotel. I get on the elevator. God is my witness. I cannot make this up. I get on the elevator, and Ali and his handler get on the elevator with me. It's me, Muhammad Ali, and his handler. So I go, I go, I don't um, let me see. So I go, uh, um, I said, I don't know if you can see this picture, but this is the picture right here. I'm gonna take me off the screen. Hold, 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 hold tight, hold tight. That's the picture right there. That was right that's before I was ready to walk into the man. ring. That's the classic, man. So, so <laughs> let me tell you this story. So, so I'm on the uh, elevator with Ali, and I go. You know, excuse me, Mr. I said, excuse me, I didn't say Mr. Ali. I said, excuse me, Mr. Muhammad, but can, can I get an autograph? And he said, yeah, you can get one. And then he said, but I didn't have no paper. I mean, I got boxing gear on me. So I pull out a dollar bill. He signs my dollar bill, right? So I'm like, I'm look, I'm cherishing this dollar bill. So when I get back to Columbus at my house, I take the dollar bill and I don't know where to put it. So I hide it in one of those old record player, you know, things. And when I moved out of Columbus, I got the dollar there. <laughs> I was like, man. So, so. The experience, though. He took time. I mean, twice. Okay, so twice I got one more for you. So here, here's the third. So I moved to LA. I'm in Los Angeles. And I'm doing my thing. And my buddy becomes this brother named Yaya, Johnny McClain. Yaya. Yaya was the gentleman that was married to Layla Ali. He was the one that pushed Layla through all of her boxing career. He was the one you used to see in the ring with the nice brim. You know, the women used to go crazy for him. You know what I mean? Like, oh, who's that? And that was Layla's husband. Him and I became best friends. We're still good friends to this day. So he comes by my house one day in LA and he sees this picture and he goes, damn it, that's a fat picture. I said, thanks, man. That go, I said, Yaya, you think you can get Ali to sign it? He said, give me the picture. Took the picture, Ali signed it right there. That's the signature on the picture. If you can see wow, it, I see it. Yeah, so that's my famous Muhammad Ali story. So, but anyway, I got into the boxing game, and let me just tell you, I know we're going to get short on time, but so I, uh, what happened was in 19, 2017, I went back to Philadelphia to do a comedy show, and I ran into one of my old boxing teammates from the gym. And I said, hey, he told me about the trainers. I was asking about people. And one of the trainers had died. And the other trainer, Frank Taylor, was still alive. So I said, hey, you know, can you have a number? So I got a number on Frank. That was in August of 2017. So in October, in October, I wind up calling him. I said, let me call Frank. I said, let me see how you're doing. So I called him. And this is what happened. So he, I called him. And I said, he said, the voice said, hello. And I ain't seen this man in 40 years, bro. Like, since I left Philly. I go, is this Frank? He's, I said, is Frank Taylor there? He goes, this is Frank Taylor. And I go, Frank, how you doing? This is Dan and Green. I used to box for you when I was a kid. And he goes, Dan and Green, Dan and Green, Dan and Green, Felton Street, Southpaw, good fighter. Yeah, I remember you. And, man, it almost made me cry. Because I was like, this man remembered everything about me, where I lived. And I left because everybody was sad when I moved out of Philly when my mom died. Like, nobody wanted me to move. Like, everybody liked me. And it was just a sad time for me. And he remembered me. And then so we talked for like about 20 minutes, 25. And then I said to him, I said, I said, Frank, let me do the story about the executioners. Because I thought it was a story there. And he said something to me. He said, man, I always felt there was a story there. I just didn't know how to get it out. And I said, let me do it. So I just put, I found a partner, a business partner to go in with me. 
I was doing well in commercials, so I had money, and I took my money, my business partner. We went together. I went back to Philly four times over the last, the, the next year, the next year. Did interviews, North Carolina, New York. I got Mark Breland, Buddy McGirt, Sh Shang Mosley, um, Malik Scott. Uh, I got. You met uh, Mark Breland in in your amateur in career. Movie. Yes. Um, I got, uh, and everybody's related to the story. I got. Um, Mark Greenland was in your story. He's in the movie, yes, because he knew about one of the fighters. Yeah, he, yeah. He's a southpaw? No, no, Bre no Breland was an orthodox fighter, right handed. But he's from Brooklyn. Yep. We remember Mark Breland. Yeah. Yep. Wow. So, so that's what happened. And uh, Breland's in the documentary. Um, and then I wound up getting um, um, uh, Sean O'Grady, the, the great light heavyweight we had back in the day. And then I got Bernard Hopkins in it. You got Hop? B Hop is in it. It's a great story, bro. It's a great story. It's about these, it pretty much, it's about these two men who started this gym in Philly to get the boys off the street and wound up creating one of the best amateur boxing teams the country ever saw. You know Baltimore. I'm in Baltimore. We got a little little boxing history here. I like yeah. I like your boy Javante da uh, Javante Davis. I like him. He's a good dude. I like him. He can go. He's southpaw. Yeah, he can go. Yep. So it's a great story, man. I hope you can make it up for the screening, bro. And um, when when and where? So the screening is going to take place. I'm gonna send you the link, and maybe you can put the link up on your page. But it's going to be at the Pennsylvania Academy of Fine Arts, downtown Philadelphia, I from 4 o'clock in the afternoon to 8 p.m. When? You got a four-hour window on when? October 22nd, next Saturday, the Saturday before this last, the 22nd of October. So I want to share something with you. We've been, we've been, we created these uh, Black Wall Street plaques. Okay. About 11 years ago, we're giving away over 1,900. So in Baltimore, New York became our go-to, DC, Atlanta. We never done an awards in Philly. Right. <laughs> Maybe I gotta come just to find the spot where we are gonna do our first awards in Philly. Man, we'd love to have you, brother. It'd mean, it'd mean, it'd mean, It'll mean everything to me. You Next know what I'm Saturday, saying? the 22nd. The 22nd, from 4 o'clock to 8. You come up, brother, you got your ticket. Don't even worry about it. Just come on through. 4 o'clock on Philly. Where's it going to be? At the Pennsylvania Academy of Fine Arts, 120 North Broad Street. And if you want to buy tickets, you can um, go to the link, Eventbrite. Um, and um, what I can do is, uh, or you can, I'll send you the link. And I don't know how you edit your show or whatever. I'll send you the link right off to this phone number you gave me. And then um, I love for your people to come or whatever. But it's, it's uh, you know, it's going to be good. Yeah, your girl from Chicago. Tell me about Cynthia Boykin. Well, I met Cynthia Boykin in 2007 or 8, I believe it was. Um, I was doing a, sh a comedy show in Chicago for Damon Williams. And um, she was at the show. And I saw her and I was like, okay, she's kind of cute. And, you know, I tried to holler and she didn't break down, but we became best of friends. And that was, <laughs> that's our story. <laughs> so, uh, and um, because she was actually, I, you know, it's funny when you meet people, you think you're trying to talk to them, but she was so professional. And then I knew that she had a lot, you know, after speaking with her, she had so much going on. I, I said, it's better to have her at a, as an ally. So, um, and she's been a very big help to me over the years. That's, that sounds like a grown man. Yeah, thank you. you know, a lot of times we, we may see this, and like you say, we miss the entire blessing. I've learned in business, somebody like Cynthia Boykin, be the best thing to happen to you in business. Best thing that ever happened. And she came out to my, I screened this documentary last year, and she was um, in town, and she in, in um, Los Angeles last year at Kevin Hart's studio. It was a sold-out event packed everything it was great 
and um, red carpet event. And she came to that. And so she, I told her about this and she asked me about this and um, I didn't even ask her for the help. She just, she connected me with you and, and said, Hey, you know, but I think what happens, uh, Donnie is when, you know, and I like to tell this to your audience, when you do right by people, people remember that, you know what I mean? But people remember you more if you do something wrong to them. So obviously I haven't done anything wrong to, you know, a lot of people, at least mentally or physically. So I haven't done anything. So people at the end of the day, I've had a lot of support because people do want to help people. It's just that a lot of times I always feel that you can't come to the table empty handed. you got to, you know, you got to meet people halfway. And what I mean by that is you got to have something, you know, unless you can just get lucky and someone like you and they can put you on, you got to come to the table with something. You know what I mean? Especially if you're trying two, to do it right. I got two important questions. Okay. What is that symbol on your hat, number one? Okay. Well, first of all, um, I am in a fraternity. I'm Omega. I'm a bro. So rude to all the bros that might want to watch uh, watching this. That ain't no Omega. Yeah, no, no, I know that out, but I'm letting the people know <laughs> that I'm a bro. This is actually Mizuno. I'm a big golfer. And this is a, a Mizuno hat. See it right there? It's a golf hat. Okay. Is it supposed to be like an antelope or a deer or something? I don't know. It's just a symbol. Okay, okay, okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Uh, now. But I got, I, about, I got about five minutes before I have to roll. Okay. This is a real simple question. Okay. We talked around it, but I really didn't hear you articulate it per se. Right. I never heard you in this entire 55 minutes act like a victim when it comes to being black. I don't believe in that. I, and I know we've had it tough, but you, you have to understand for me, and I get, you know, people go at me sometimes and say, oh man, what, you know, they try to say, am I a Republican? I'm, I used to be a Democrat. I'm, a, I'm in terms of politics. I'm independent, but let me tell you why. I'm independent too. I'm gonna I tell you why. Myself. Yeah, I'm a foster kid, and for three to four years of my life, I was raised by white people in in foster care in cottages. So when I got up to go to school in the morning, that's who I saw to make food for me and to make sure I got to school. Never abused, never treated wrong, never called anything outside of my name, and so. My social worker in New York was a Latino woman, Mrs. Siegel. This is as a kid, I remember this before. So from 10 months to seven, I had these type of people in my life. And I can't go on and hate someone that, you know for that. Now I do know how we've been treated. I know how we what we've gone through, but I can't blame everybody for that. And I look and I and I look at us now as a as a culture and I go, we have to start answering some of these questions that we're doing to ourselves. And people don't want to hear that, but you know, all you got to do is turn on Instagram or go to a fans only page or Facebook and see what we're doing to each other. How all we're I got to do is look out my door and see a cat trying to post up on my corner with that okie doke, right? So I just they ain't, I white. Never, they ain't white, they ain't no other race, they black, right? And they're so, damn terrorists, think, yeah, yeah. So I don't, I can't blame them because even with my project, man, when I was low on cash. This dude from Florida sent me, I didn't even ask, I asked, yo, can you, can you help me out? He sent me $13,000 over three checks. Didn't ask for a penny back. And he's a stone cold Republican. But he said, and I said to him, I said, look, man, I, I'm, I was letting him know what I was doing with the money. I said, look, this is what I'm doing with it. Right there. One second. I got somebody to do it. He was like, I was letting him know what I um was doing. And he goes, I said, you know, because I, I wanted to be honest about where the money was going. Well, thank you. And he goes, I don't know you that well because I met him for about <laughs> in, in Vegas. He said, but I trust you. I believe that you're going to do right by the money. I just have that in my feelings. And the man gave let's, me. Let's, let's, let's put his name out there. What's his name? I can't I can't do that because. Okay, of, okay, okay. Well, we, yeah. have read, we thank you, sir. Yeah. And Dannon is about his business. He's representing the cause very well. Right. Yeah. This guy's a very, you know, he, 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 he he's okay. You know what I mean? So I just, well, because of that, that's, and people like that, 
And I'm in on both sides, black, white. I can't, I, I, you're an individual to me. If I don't like you, trust me, you know. You know, I don't mess with you. You know what I mean? And if I got an issue with you, I'm gonna go to you with the issue. You'll never see me on social media talking about my issue with someone else. I go directly to that person. And when we can't handle it, or we wanna handle it, and then after that, I'm done with it. I don't believe in all of that other talk. All that talking, I don't do all that. I'm not an arguer. Because when I because when I get ready to get busy, when these when these things go up, I mean business. And as simple as that. I do not play with it. So that's why I have a lot of respect out here in LA. And that's why people respect me because I don't do that. I don't play games. And I'm very hospitality to people. I treat people nice. But so I don't get into it. You'll never see me on social media going back and forth. When I when it, when I'm in it, I'm in it. You know. Much respect, Dan and Green. Uh, the twenty second next Saturday is my goal. Yes, be up here in Philadelphia. You gonna please? Show me. Thank you. Tell your people about it. I'm gonna I'm gonna send you the link. And I just appreciate, man. D, I appreciate you so much, man. And we can definitely talk more later on. But you know, oh, hey, Troy, this is what it's Troy about. Rollins, Troy Rollins is on this network. This is my. That's my guy. I know. I saw your yeah. interview. Yes, Troy yeah. Rollins. That's our Baltimore yeah. homeboy. Yes. Good deal. Thank you very much. Thank you, Cynthia. Have a great day, thank everybody. You, Good morning. Donnie, bro. thank you. And thank you, Baltimore and the yes, East sir. Coast. Love you. Yes, sir. Love you back, big brother. My man.